Let's talk about B12 deficiency symptoms that you never want to ignore. The interesting thing about B12 is that most people think about a vegan or a vegetarian being deficient in B12 because B12 normally comes from animal products, but there are so many other ways that you could become deficient that you need to be aware of. So if you're not able to make DNA correctly or repair DNA, number one, you're put at a higher risk for cancer and other problems. Number two, the red blood cell. If you can't make red blood cells, you cannot carry oxygen. You become anemic. So that's another big one. And number three, your nervous system and your brain. In order to make the myelin sheath, the stuff around the nerves, B12 is necessary. And without the B12, without the myelin, you get a short-circuiting neurological problems that don't just affect your hands and feet, but they affect your brain. But we're gonna get more into that when we talk into the severe long-term deficiency of B12. So when a person is first deficient in B12, they're usually gonna just feel a little tired. They're gonna feel a little bit weaker because the red blood cell is just not able to carry oxygen. They might look a little pale and that's the anemia because they don't have as many red blood cells. And they might even then noticing tingling in their fingertips or their feet, which is the start of nerve problems. But then as time progresses, other things can happen. Your tongue becomes very smooth, shiny, and red and swollen. You can develop mouth ulcers, which by the way, I had that when I was younger. You could become out of breath very easily. You get dizzy when you stand up too quickly. Those are severe anemia symptoms. Then you start having cognitive problems. Then also your mood starts going down. You start getting anxiety. Other symptoms include circadian rhythm issues. So your sleep cycles are off. So you just don't sleep that good anymore. And then also because B12 is involved with the nervous system, the person starts developing kind of a deficiency of neurotransmitters that show up as depression. I mean, how many people that are depressed end up going on medication when they really just have a B12 deficiency? That would be terrible because that would camouflage the symptom and they would never get better. Also, if you're deficient in B12, you can have problems with something called a vitiligo where the actually normal pigment on the skin is not there anymore. So you get these white specks throughout the body. So there'll be a problem with pigmentation to the body and sometimes even the cracks in the corner of your mouth right here. And I had that as well growing up. Now, when things get really severe, you start having all sorts of problems with walking, severe muscle weakness, a lot more psychiatric problems that go beyond just depression, like hallucinations, paranoia. Okay, paranoia. Now, even if you have a subclinical B12 deficiency, you may feel like doom and gloom for no reason. I know some people have that at night. They have like night terrors. And the worst problem about a B12 deficiency chronically or long-term is permanent irreversible nerve damage. This is where you have all sorts of pain syndromes that are next, next to impossible to reverse. Now, the unique thing about getting B12 from the diet is that if you're not consuming animal products, you're not gonna probably get it. So vegans or vegetarians need to take B12. Now, before I get into the very strange and unique ways that you could become deficient, let's just talk about the foods that are the absolute highest for B12. At the very top of the list, this food has the most B12, the clams. Okay, clams, who would think? And then we get into liver. Then we get sardines. Then we get red meat. Now, if you do a search on what foods are high in B12, you're not gonna find red meat. Why? Because these search engines are programmed to filter out, because they're very biased sometimes, anything related to red meat. And then if you ask like ChatGPT, uh, why didn't you include that? They're gonna say because red meat is gonna put you at risk for cancer and cardiovascular problems. And, and then you can go back and forth with ChatGPT and argue with it till eventually you'll say, well, wait a second. Now, isn't there a difference between grass-fed uh, red meat and processed meat? And then ChatGPT will apologize and say, you're right. And there is no research on grass-fed meat. And so you really got to be careful about the search engines because red meat is one of the best sources of B12. Then we get to the tuna and the salmon and then grass-fed dairy, and eggs. So those are the foods that have a lot of B12 and our body cells don't make B12. However, in our large intestine, we do make some B12, okay? But the problem is we can't absorb it in that large intestine. So you never see that B12. It's probably used by your microbes, okay? But the way B12 works is that B12 has a, a trace mineral in it called cobalt, okay? And so here you have this cobalt uh, vitamin B12, you consume it, 
it goes down to the stomach. Now, because this B12 has a protein molecule connected with it, it can be destroyed by the stomach acid. So it quickly attaches to another compound to protect it, okay? And then when it goes into the small intestine, it gets absorbed. Here's the problem, okay? If you have low stomach acid, you're not gonna be able to absorb B12, okay? It's not gonna work. How many people have low stomach acid? Huge amounts, especially as you get older. After the age of 70, the pH, the acid in your stomach is down by 80%. The term is called chlorhydria, okay? Low stomach acid. And I used to test this in my office all the time and I would find people, a lot of people had low stomach acid, especially if they had heartburn, acid reflux, GERD, always low stomach acid. So they were very deficient in B12. If you have a genetic problem, which is more common than you might think, the term for that is called polymorphism, not that you needed to know that, but if you get a genetic test, a DNA test, you may find you have a problem absorbing B12. So this is why I take B12 on a regular basis. Now, if you ever, ever take B12 supplements, make sure that you always take the natural form called methylcobalamin. But realize taking B12 is only the tip of the iceberg. You have to have a, a healthy liver. You have to have an acidic stomach. You have to have a healthy small intestine. A lot of things have to be right for you to absorb B12. Now, since we're on the topic of B12, there's a little bit more you should know about that in this video right here. Check it out. Today, I'm going to talk about a version of vitamin B12 that I would recommend avoiding. It's called cyanocobolamine. Now, cobolamine is a molecule with cobalt. It's kind of a foundational structure of B12. And then there's different versions of B12. Cyanocobolamine is the synthetic version. It's very, very cheap. It's in pretty much all the fortified grains like cereals, snack bars. It's in most um, one-a-day synthetic vitamins. And if I'm not mistaken, it's also fortified in infant formulas and things like that. And it's definitely in energy drinks as well. And sometimes it has very high doses Sometimes between 8,000 to 14,000 percent are requirements. And the problem that I don't like about it is the cyanide part of it. There's a cyanide molecule attached to this cobolamin that a lot of times people will brush off as being, well, it's, it's insignificant, it's a small amount, our liver can detoxify it fine. But what about if someone's doing these energy drinks, taking vitamins, doing a lot of refined grains, getting massive, massive amounts of this cyanocobolamine. Cyanide shuts down the oxygen to your mitochondria, so it destroys the motor of the mitochondria. In fact, this is interesting. When you get cyanide poisoning or even carbon monoxide poisoning and you go to the emergency room, they have to give you a remedy to counter that, and that happens to be something I've been talking about in some recent videos called methylene blue. Methylene blue is the antidote to cyanide because it bypasses the the mitochondrial damage, and it gives mitochondria the oxygen it needs. And a lot of the B12 injections, they're using this synthetic version as well. And so there is some side effects like vomiting, stomach problems, uh, a potassium deficiency, which can lead to uh, arrhythmias, headache, fever, dizziness, etc. But personally, I think the biggest problem with this cyanocobolamine is the cyanide part. You just don't need a lot of cyanide in the body. But it is true that our liver does have the ability to detoxify small amounts of cyanide, but what I'm talking about is larger amounts, okay? And now, if we compound that on what I am finding on quite a few DNA tests is the inability to fully detoxify. In other words, there are a lot of people that have mutations or problems with their detoxification genes. So if that's a problem and you're taking a lot of the cyanide, you might have a difficult time getting rid of it. Now, on top of that, there's also a very common genetic problem relating to methylation, which is basically adding something to a chemical compound in your body to help you detoxify, to help things work better, to help you become healthier. And so you possibly have heard of this genetic problem. It's called MTHFR. I mean, it sounds like a swear word, but it's not. <laughs> But if you have a mutation with this gene, you're going to have a hard time with methylation, which means that if you take the wrong B12, okay, the form of B12, you're going to have even worse problems. The type of B12 that you need, if you have that genetic problem, the more you're going to need a natural form of B12. And the one I'm talking about is methylcobalamin. 
And just as a side note, I would always take that with methyl folate as well, because if you're also taking synthetic folate, which is also in the enriched in grain products, uh, you can have more of a problem. But methylcobalamin is the one I would recommend because it's going to help you if you have these genetic issues. And methylcobalamin is an active form of B12. It stays in the body a lot longer than the synthetic versions. It can really greatly improve your sleep. It can decrease the need for sleep. It can help you wake up feeling alert and refreshed. It can prevent the person who just doesn't get tired at night that just lays there until two or three in the morning. It's great for the nervous system, especially your myelin sheath, because if you're deficient, uh, you're going to have problems with numbness, tingling, paresthesia, and a lot of other degeneration issues of the nervous system. This methylcobalamin is also really good for visual accommodation, so your ability to see things without needing glasses, okay? So many times people will start taking methylcobalamin and noticing that their vision is better. Methylcobalamin also can help you increase melatonin. That's probably why it helps your sleep. It also decreases something called homocysteine, which can put you at risk for heart attacks or a stroke. It even can help regulate cortisol, that stress hormone. It's also important to mention that a lot of people are deficient in B12 for other reasons, not because they're not consuming even the right form of B12 or foods high in B12, like liver or red meat or eggs, things like that, but they might have inflammation in the stomach. Also, they might have H. pylori. Uh, active, or they might have low hydrochloric acid, or they might have gastric bypass, or even inflammation in the intestines, especially the lower last part of the small intestine, which is where you absorb B12. So if there's inflammation there, let's say they have IBS or Crohn's or diverticulitis or whatever, and then they're going to need to take more of B12 in the right form. B12 is very, very important for your red blood cells. And so if you're low in B12, you can be anemic and when we're taking the wrong type of B12, like the cyanocobalamin, which actually has a direct effect on oxygen to your red blood cells, it doesn't make sense. You don't need to add more cyanide to your diet. There's other forms of B12, like hydroxycobalamin, but that has to be converted. And also another one called adenosylcobalamin, which is the active form, okay? So it is active and it's not bad to take, but it, it doesn't have the methyl connected to it that we need in so many genetic problems. Anyway, I wanted to bring up the importance of taking the right form of B12 and avoiding the wrong type of B12. And hopefully you're not one of those people who are do a lot of these energy drinks or grains. But if you are, you should probably know what diet to be on. And for that information, you should check this video out right here.